Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. <laughs> uh, welcome to the second edition of Epicenter Live here from DAPCON. Uh, thank you for being here in such large numbers. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, we, we did this the first time at the Cosmos Interchange Foundation um, conference in June, was it? And thought it was a good idea to, you know, keep doing this uh, when we come to events as it allows us to you know, put some faces on our audience, likewise for you guys, and, uh, and also get some questions from the audience and, and put that out on the podcast. So first, I'd like to address this conference. Um, oh, by the way, I'm Sebastian Cuccio. I'm the host of Epicenter, and I'm joined today by... Uh, I'm Sunny Agarwal, and I'm also co-host of Epicenter. Work on a bunch of different things, including Cosmos and a bunch of other stuff. I'm Friederike Ernst. I'm also co-host of Epicenter, uh, surprisingly. Uh, and I'm also the COO of Gnosis. Right, so before we start off, I'd just like to you know, talk about this conference and Berlin Blockchain Week, uh, specifically. So, Friederike, you, know, you worked on organizing this conference. Uh, tell us a little bit about that journey and um, how things have changed since last year when you first did the conference. Sure. Um, so, we actually put this together because we thought um, it would be super nice to have a conference dedicated to the apps. Um, and this is what DevCon has always meant to be. Um, last year, we had around four or 500 attendees. This year, it's way more. I think we're at 1,300 or something. Um, and uh, I, th I think it, 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 uh, we want to create a venue that uh, lets people network and uh, uh, learn about the exciting projects in this space. Yeah, it's really impressive that you went from 600 attendees to 1,300 attendees. <laughs> do you think that reflects uh, growth in the space generally, or like what do you attribute to that uh, growth in, in attendance? Um, I attribute it to growth in builders. So I think this is very much a conference that is centered around building. I mean, there's other business-centered conferences and conferences that are um, centered around what I would uh, somewhat uh, de depreciatively call speculation. Um, and this is very much not one of these conferences. This is very much a conference that was meant um, to be for people who build. Um, and for people who are interested in uh, apps that are being built and in driving user adoption. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, I think um, despite the market being what it is, I mean, it's recovered somewhat, but I think uh, this has had a surprisingly little impact on people who actually build the apps. Yeah, and what I like about it is that it, it, it kind of, you, the, the talks and the, the topics that are discussed here are on all different levels of the stack, right? So there are talks about, um, about dApps themselves and the applications that people are building, but there are also some technical talks. And so there's sort of something for everyone from that perspective. Um, Tony, what did you think? Um, yeah. So, I mean, so when you say uh, dApp, it's a, it's a conference really focused on dApps. Where do you, what do you define as a dApp? What's the, bound, like, you know, would core protocol stuff be considered DAPs or is like DeFi considered a DAP? What's the boundary of what a, a DAP is? That's that's actually a very good question. So I think we, this has shifted somewhat. So basically, we, before we, when we actually organized the first conference, we we, we said it's it's going to be centered around DAPs only, um, and then it expanded somewhat into infrastructure because basically we're still in the infrastructure phase. We still need to build a lot of the building blocks that we're actually building on. So you can't really exclude that from the conversation. Um, and this is why it, it's kind of, it's, it's crept back in. Um, and I think the conference is better for it. Um, we also um, expand the other way. So basically uh, we also look at governance and legal questions just because that's, that's the other constraint, right? So um, yeah, so it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's the, sc the scope has been enlarged somewhat, um, but we, we, we think it makes sense the way that it is right now. Yeah, I want to talk about the infrastructure building phase in, <laughs> in a little bit, because I'm, I'm a little, uh, my, my position on that is somewhat nuanced, but um, let's, let's talk about the state of the ecosystem a little bit and you know, how things has evolved, have evolved since last year. And I think like, a lot of things have changed in a year, if we just take like this conference as sort of a milestone. Um, 
what in your, in your minds are uh, the most apparent uh, evolutions that we've seen like, you know, in a year? Um, I think every conference I've been to this year has had some sort of burner wallet that they've been giving out and like trying to encourage people to use like usually die or something like that. So I think, I don't know, really a focus on that has really been like what I noticed at every single conference I've been to this year that wasn't really there last year. Yeah, I realized this morning that I had 20 cents of ether in my, uh, in my DAPCON uh, gift bag. Yeah. <laughs> you also have a, uh, a proof of attendance protocol. Uh, right, yeah. Uh, NFT there. Um, and then, yeah, so I guess, you know, another one is uh, definitely much more focused on, uh, I think, NFTs and DeFi and th th those, a lot of, like, people are creating, like, cool, like, collectibles and stuff, so. Yeah, NFTs are, just seem to be everywhere uh, at this conference. Um, what are the interesting use cases that, cause, I mean, it, it's kind of cool to have these NFTs, right, and, like, proof of attendance and, and, um, and it's a neat experiment, but, like, branching off into actual use cases, where do you guys feel that? That, that could be used uh, outside of the sort of crypto space? Oh, I think there's really no limit as to what they can be used for, right? I mean, so basically, if you, if you think of your daily life, uh, the minority of things are actually fungible. So almost everything is non-fungible. So basically saying what can they be used for is, uh, to me, is a little bit moot because uh, they can be used for literally everything. So. Yeah, I mean... I, I think that like the collectibles use case is, is a nice use case actually. I think that's probably one of the more useful ones. Uh, and I think it's, uh, what it's doing is it's helping getting the uh, UX figured out for when we actually have uh, real more useful stuff coming onto the system. And I, I think that's what a lot of this stuff, sh like I, you know a lot of the, I, I know a lot, I, a lot of like the things people are talking about, like you know, there's definitely a lot of talk about ga blockchain gaming and stuff. I think it was maybe maybe a bit more last year, but um, and I, I originally I was always very like, uh, that's a very like lame use of blockchains. Like that's like, why are we even focusing? If that's what this is used for, like why are we even doing this? But then you know, I, I think I came around a little bit where I'm like, okay, maybe we can just I, I can take this in a positive spin, which is like, oh, all this effort being put into gaming is more. Uh, just helping get the UX right, and that way when we have actually more useful stuff coming on, we've actually practiced the UX with this gaming stuff. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, sort of the, the gaming is, is a bit of a, a playground, a uh, sandbox, if you will, um, and we're getting to experiment with this stuff until, you know, until which point the UX, and, and we figured out all the kinks to be able to implement it as sort of a real world scenario for like more serious quote unquote things. Um, I think one thing that, I, so yesterday I saw uh, Jared's talk um, about Embark, and although I, I sort of followed Embark a little bit from, from a distance, I, I was re really impressed by um, the quality of like, that toolkit, and I think that's one thing probably, that if you would compare it to last year, um, developers coming into the space probably like I had a lot of, um, uh, onboarding and uh, the the uh, the learning curve must have been much higher. I mean, I'm, I'm not a developer, but I can just imagine now if you're coming on as a slowly developer and wanting to build an application, you just like npm install Embark and you have like all of your tools there, uh, sort of in one place. Um, is that something that uh, resonates with you guys too, like on the toolkit side? I mean, I know like probably more relevant uh, at Gnosis. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think that's one of that's one of the areas that's improved a lot. Uh, I think what to me is the major difference to last year is that there are actually now apps that people are using for real world use cases. So things like Compound or, um, you know, Unis yeah, like fully decentralized apps like Uniswap and DYDX. And I mean, it's, it's being used. And, um, and I, um, I think that uh, the uptake is going to be much greater next year. And I mean, this is, I, to me, this is super promising. So last year, I mean, there was Maker, <laughs> and uh, people were opening CDPs last year. But uh, th that was more or less uh, the extent of uh, dApps being used. And uh, this has changed completely. I mean, now you can interact with uh, many protocols, and it doesn't really take uh, a developer to do it. Uh, and to me, that's uh, that's a major difference. Mm. So, admittedly, you know, I haven't done uh, 
a, I'd say, large scale Ethereum, like Solidity project since like maybe early 2018. The last like large thing I did was uh, uh, the peg zone for Cosmos, uh, so an Ethereum bridge. Um, and that, you know, that, and that back then, I, you know, even then, I think that tooling was already getting better than what I was working on like a year prior, back in 2017 when I was at Consensus. And so I'm sure the tooling has gotten better even since then. Um, but then I think the other thing is as well where uh, I think there's m a lot more frameworks that are being built right now. And so I think I, you know, it's, it's really cool to see a lot more applications being built using things like the Cosmos SDK and uh, Parity Substrate and stuff. And so uh, I like that the, that the range of tooling for building applications is increasing beyond just uh, one framework, which is what we've traditionally had so far. And I'm looking forward for like more smart, co oh, and you know, I know Viper adoption has gone up at, as well. Like, you know, Uniswap is actually written in Viper rather than in Solidity. And so I, I like to see like the range of options in developer tooling also be increased. Mm. So let's talk about DeFi a little bit more and, and um, how that plays into adoption, because you said like a lot of people are using uh, these tools now, and I have a somewhat nuanced view about that, but I mean, we can get into it. But essentially, my, 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 my whole thing uh, since, since we've been here is that the metric that you know, we should be looking at collectively as, as a space is mon monthly active non-crypto non savvy users or like monthly active non-crypto nerds. Mm -hmm. uh, and although there are like a lot of tools like Compound and Maker and, 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 um, and even like the wallets that allow you to interact with those things like Argent, and all these tools are becoming more and more mature and the user, ex the user experience is great and the onboarding is great and all that stuff. Um, and you can actually you know, use them and gain interest. The number of people that are entering the space that are, um, I guess, like your quote unquote normal user, like, I don't know, like my parents or you know, friends of mine that have nothing to do in the crypto space, I don't think that those types of people are, um, I don't think that we're, we're seeing growth there generally. Uh, do, you, do you agree with this? And do you think this is a good metric to evaluate the success of the space? So, question though, is that a fair question when you say how many non-crypto nerds are using this stuff? Because I feel like as soon as someone starts using it, we start calling them a crypto nerd. I mean, I would love to be in, this, in a place where people are entering the space and they don't really care about coming to, say, like, crypto conferences and understanding the technology, but just are using Compound to, like, make interest uh, like instead of having a savings account, for example. Yeah. Um, I guess like, you know, one question I've been thinking about is most of the DeFi stuff on Ethereum heavily assume, the only reason you'd participate right now is you're assuming that the price of Ether is gonna go up. Um, <clears throat> the reason you, you know, you're, 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 the reason you'd take out a maker CDP is because you wanna still be exposed to Ether while, uh, you know, having some liquidity through DAI. Or the reason you, you take, you use Compound is because, you know, you're, you, you still want to be exposed to Ether while you're, you know, and, and so that's, you know, I'm kind of, I am kind of curious as to like how much DeFi adoption is coming from people who are not just approaching it from a speculation aspect. Okay. I, I, do, I do get where you're coming from and I think uh, there are things that we could do uh, collectively as a space um, to make it more welcoming to other people and also more usable to ourselves. So, I mean, there are things that where I'm not quite clear why they're not, um, why they're not more widely used. Um, so, I mean, obviously we can always say they're scaling and things aren't fast enough and uh, transactions are too expensive and so on. But that's, that's where we're at. That's what we have to deal with. But you know, setting that aside and saying this is what we'll work on, there are still things that we can improve like what? for ourselves. For, for instance, um, it strikes me that smart wallets are actually currently underutilized. So basically things like Argent and the Gnosis Safe, um, what they in principle, what they allow you is, you, you know when you use MetaMask and it, it, it asks you to set 
um, a, uh, a permission, and then d d d d d you need to trans do a second transaction to actually do the transactions. I mean, that's really bad user experience, and in princi principle, with smart wallets, you don't have to do that. You can wrap them. Um, but basically, uh, D-app developers have to be aware of that and have to build that into their D-apps. And I think this, for instance, is one thing that will make it much, much easier for people and much, I mean, I think easier is maybe not the right word, but it'll, it'll be more seamless mm -hmm. and it'll feel better and it'll feel, it, it'll feel like a more, um, a more consistent user flow and it'll make people less wary about what they're doing, it'll make them less suspicious, um, and it'll feel more natural in, in, in uh, using it. And I think this is going to be, despite the fact that, that from a technical point of view, it's not difficult, it's not, something that's, um, it's not something that's not there now, it's something that you can build with very minimal additional effort, um, but I think it'll make the user experience for everyone much better. Do you think part of the uh, user experience issue is that people need to have Ether in order to uh, participate? Um, I think for the people who are currently participating, it's not that big of an issue, but I think in the long run, yes, I think it's going to be an issue. And I think this is also something that uh, we as Gnosis had anticipated would be an issue. And uh, I mean, basically what the Gnosis Save allows you to do is to pay gas um, in other tokens via relay service, so you don't actually need to hold Ether in order to, uh, to uh, d d d transact. Even like any token, like yeah. <clears throat> the common person doesn't have, not, they don't have Ether, but they also don't have like any ERC-20 token, yeah. or they don't have any crypto in general. And like, you know, for, for example, uh, the cards that we got at the registration, they have like the proof of attendance protocol token mm -hmm. on it, but uh, you know, he had to load it with 20 cents of Ether so that people could actually, you know, withdraw that, move that uh, token from that card onto their own account. And that's like, a, that's like an additional 20 cents uh, like per user acquisition cost. And that's like, it, it, it seems almost like a sunk, like silly cost, acquisition cost that's being, at, like an additional acquisition cost that crypto companies have to deal with. I, I agree. Um, I think this is not something that is currently limiting crypto companies. And I think basically having meta transactions and um, having people subsidize these costs yeah. in order to to gain adoption is something that we'll see more and more, and we're seeing it now. So I mean, basically, this is one of the one of the you know first and foremost use cases of meta transactions and what they're actually being used for right now. Yeah, I mean, it, so this morning I was like going through my my Argent wallet and looking at it with like a fresh pair of eyes, uh, almost as though I wasn't a crypto user. So it's like looking. At and, and, and so as as someone opening this wallet for the first time. A lot of the crypto stuff is kind of abstracted behind the user, the user experience. And even there's a function in there where you, one can, I think you can buy with your credit card, uh, at least like with, with my account, I, th I think you could. So it, it seems like anyone who's reasonably savvy about investments, maybe not like Joe everybody, but someone who's like reasonably savvy about finance and investments and like is mindful and considerate about where they want to place their money, you know, mm -hmm. medium to long term, whatever, could open this app and say, hey, like, hmm, I can get 10% returns on whatever this thing is. Okay, like, I'm going to buy with my credit card and, and try it out. So, so, so the gap there between being just like a Revolut uh, account uh, is, and, and like a crypto account is actually narrowing. What's, what, what does it take to get maybe you know, 10,000, 100,000, a million users to onboard this I, thing and like, to benefit this yeah, so great I, interest rate? I totally see that, but I, I think there's, there's two conflicting things here, right? So basically, as far as I know, Arjun still is invite only, is that sure. correct? Yeah, so course. basically because they're, they're actually paying for the deployment of your smart contract, so they yeah. can't open that up, uh, up to everyone. Um, and I think the people who need these things to be abstracted away from them. Um, these are not the people who are currently using them or who want to use them. So I, I feel like there's somewhat of a disconnect between, so for instance, um, things like, would you actually want to be able to set how much gas you're paying for a transaction? So I think the people who are currently using these wallets, yes, absolutely, they would totally set this and they would be comfortable setting this, um, but we're still abstracting it away from them 
in anticipation of who, we, who we'd actually want to use this wallet, and these are the per per people we're currently not onboarding. I, yeah, so this is kind of the disconnect that I'm seeing, and I'm not sure how to tackle it. Yeah. So, so you think there's a, the, the cost to onboarding users w is, is quite high and might be a, a, a hindrance for, for crypto companies to like, onboard like tens of thousands of people at once? Um, yeah, do, I, I do think that uh, basically onboarding people onto smart contract wallets is currently costly if you scale it up, yes. Mm. So. I mean, I'm just thinking of this, but would it be, I don't know if it's technically feasible to do this, but where if you onboard, maybe your, your smart contract wallet gets created the first time you, you put money into a compound account and then the, the interest that you get on the compound account, like the first whatever, 20 cents or 50 cents would go to pay the smart contract fee. But I mean, then, then you actually have the, then, then you actually have Ether, right? So then you are actually also okay with paying it up front. Yeah. Uh, I think it's more about people who don't, so basically currently the way that it works is if, you, if you're not um, in this space yet, you need to go to a centralized exchange where you can do a fiat on RAM. So basically you need to, you can pay with your credit card to actually get Ether and then you need to move it to a, uh, to a self-custodial, sure. maybe smart contract wallet um, in order to pay for the, uh, for setting that wallet up. So it's just, yeah. I feel like someone's going to figure this out. <laughs> Someone <laughs> will build like another smart contract layer on top where like it, it allows you to do that kind of thing. So once we have the users on, what are they going to do now? Like, what, what, what do we expect? What, what, we have them on a wallet. They, they have some ETH. They, they have their smart wallet. What are they going to do on Ethereum now? Yeah, so I, th I think basically if you look at the apps that have taken off um, in the DeFi space, I mean, it, what comes to mind to me is, is Maker, Uniswap, and Compound. Uh, these are the three things that actually have meaningful volume on them. Um, and with, if, you, if you take away maker governance, all of them are extremely simple. So basically the offering um, is super simple. And I mean, we had Robert on the podcast a yeah. couple of weeks ago, and he said he made it deliberately simple and he knows that the model is wrong, but he thinks, you know, if, if um, it doesn't matter, you know, you want people using it um, and you can get it right next time. It's fine, just, you know, make something that people will, will be comfortable using. And I think with, uh, with Compound, he's actually achieved that. So it's like people are using that for, uh, you know, as a money market. Um, and uh, yes, absolutely, the, the, the way that he calculates how much uh, interest you, uh, you make on whatever you actually put um, into, uh, into the contract, yes, it's, they're, they're, you, can, you can easily find fault with it because it's extremely simplistic. Um, but I think basically not over-designing and not, um, not going crazy on the mechanism design, this is something that, uh, that this space uh, really can take from the success of Compound and uh, Maker and uh, Uniswap. Hmm. So I think we have about 10 minutes left here and I'd like to open it up for questions. But one last thing I'd like to, 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 to touch on is this idea that we're currently in the infrastructure phase and people, I think people sort of hide behind that notion that, oh, adoption isn't coming because we're in the infrastructure phase at the moment. And I would argue that like, blockchain and cryptocurrency in general has been in the infrastructure phase basically since the beginning because <laughs> like, this metric of like, non, non, or monthly active non-crypto nerds is not growing like, to the extent that like, five years ago I thought we would be at, at uh, you know, five years later. Uh, so my, my analogy is you know, it, it feels like we're building a massive airport and people are coming to the airport and people are working at the airport and there are businesses and hotels around the airport that are hosting the people living at the airport, but nobody's going to the city and there's actually nothing at the city where the airport is located, right? I, so I it's like all this infrastructure, but, but no use cases. I, I, see, I see that, um, but I would actually object to that. So I, I think what we're currently doing is we're scoping out the potential so we're, we're kind of, we're mapping out the, pot the, the, the possibility space of things that could be built in this space. And uh, I think that's roping in more and more people. And if you look at how many people um, kind of 
have you know an inkling of what's going on this in this space i think that this has increased dramatically from last year i mean obviously there were the transaction volumes last year were crazy because of speculation but if you look if if you if you take away the speculators and if you look at people who are actually interested and who who care what's going on in the space and who who care what could be built i think that is increasing what do you think sunny um yeah, I mean, I, I think the, yeah, I, I, think, I think it's actually interesting to, like, you can actually, like, see this within different communities. I feel like the Bitcoin community definitely sees it as, oh, the infrastructure's done, what we have right now is perfect. Actually, no, you know, what Satoshi had in 2009, that, that, that was perfect, actually. <laughs> um, and, like, and they're kind of really focused, I guess, more on the adoption uh, they kind of change what they mean by adoption, in my opinion, over time. But you know, it, it seems that they tend to be more on the adopt, like focus 100% on just like going out and like shilling Bitcoin and making sure yeah. Congress knows about Bitcoin and everyone and their mothers know about Bitcoin. While the Ethereum community kind of seems to be a little bit more in the infrastructure phase and more like heads down building. And I think you need a little bit of both. I think like both are kind of valuable. Mm. Yeah, I mean, to, to come back to the analogy, it, it, to me, I, I agree that, you know, that to some extent we're scoping things out, but there is, there's such a gap in between the amount of infrastructure that's being built and, like, people building layers and layers and layers and layers of infrastructure um, and an actual use case. And, you know, one could expect that to grow kind of simultaneously side by side, but, I mean, at, 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 my feeling is that at the moment, and maybe, maybe it will come. Maybe the fact that we now have Compound and these sorts of things will bring a lot of these new types of users in, like my friends from high school who are into crypto, or you know, my parents' friends, or this sort of stuff. Like, maybe that will happen, but I feel like at the moment, anyway, we're, 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 there, there's still a large gap between like, the amount of work that's being done in infrastructure and the actual returns in terms of adoption and use. Yeah, so basically, I, I, I wouldn't really see it as work being done for infrastructure. Yes, infrastructure is being built, but most of what's being done is actually knowledge work. It's actually us understanding how to best build these systems and understanding how to set up the IT infrastructure and how to build services around it and um, what, what to do for scaling. Basically, just, I mean, basically, this is something that you can't figure out on a, a, a blank sheet of paper with a with a pencil, it's something that you know you need to build, and you need to see how does this actually pan out, and how do these things fit together, and which 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 way um, can we actually combine these things to make it work? Well, I, I hope that next year, when uh, at, at, at the, the 2020 DAPCON, uh, we'll have <laughs> lots of uh, non non crypto people, and you know Venezuelan single moms, and uh, you know. <laughs> All, all these people that we're uh, hoping to onboard and and, um, and and start using this technology like for to better their lives. Um, so I'd like to open it up to questions. If there's anybody out there who's got questions on anything we discussed or questions to us. Uh, okay. I don't think we have any questions. All right. And there's nothing on the slide. So... Either. I guess, what are you most excited for going forward? Like, what, what, what in the space is exciting you the most right now? Ah, uh, there's so many things. <laughs> <laughs> um, so basically, at this conference, I spoke to someone yesterday who had um, spent their life building settlement systems for banks. And he was really, so basically he had gotten into uh, crypto in a full-time capacity recently, and he was super excited about the things that can be built. And to me, it's those kinds of conversations that make me um, really hopeful for this space. So basically, people who still see the potential. I mean, basically, all of us, we've been in this space a long time. <laughs> and to us, it's kind of worn off a little bit. But, you know, this excitement of when you hear these things for the first time and how you can do peer-to-peer -peer transactions, how you do, can do peer-to-peer -peer contracts um, and transfers of values and smart contracts and all of these things, and seeing more people, you know, I'm not going to say get suckered into that, but, you know, more people get drawn into that. Um, and I think, to me, that that's 
the most exciting thing. And to me, it, I'm super looking forward to next year to see what these people are building and the people who come after them and basically the people who haven't always been in the space but who've had careers before this and who've seen the potential of this and are moving into the space now. Mm. But are there any specific projects or use cases or applications that you're really excited for coming forward? So, I mean, I, I may be slightly biased here. Um, I'm, I'm super interested. So basically, um, prediction markets. So people in the crypto space have talked, for them, uh, talked about them for a super long time. Um, and uh, Augur has been live for a while now. And uh, Vale has been live and shut down. Um, so, live. <laughs> um, but, but, but I think that the, what, what experience has shown is that maybe you actually need to do this in a regulated fashion because it is seen as a financial product um, or a financial tool. Um, and uh, I mean, not being, I mean, as, as decentralized as technology may be, people typically are not, and being shut down is not, not a great thing. So I'm very much looking forward. So basically, um, Two or three years ago, there was a survey on uh, Cointelegraph. Um, what's the thing that you're most looking forward to in this space? And prediction market actually came in at number one, at like 33% really? or something. It, it, it's, like, it's crazy. So people in this space are really excited about this. And um, I'm looking forward to having um, uh, prediction markets with good market mechanisms that won't get shut down after a couple of months. Cool. Um, yes, uh, no, no questions from the audience? All right. Uh, well, thank you for coming and uh, for, for being with us for the second edition of Epicenter Live. So, a few announcements. So one, we're doing a meetup this evening. If you've signed up for the meetup, uh, the venue has changed. And so I sent an email to all of you who signed up already. And if you're interested in coming to the meetup, go to our Telegram. Epicenter podcast, and the address is there. It's at 6.30. We'll be having drinks at a beer garden next door. And yeah, if you don't subscribe to Epicenter, go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can listen to the podcast. We release new episodes every week and uh, cover the blockchain ecosystem at a high level. Uh, all aspects of the blockchain ecosystem. Uh, <laughs> so we'd be happy to have you as a listener. Thank you. <laughs>